Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our Precision Cornea Rounds. Uh, today, we're very uh, honored to have three people with us, um, all experts in something that's quite, uh, quite rare and quite specialized. And we're going to be hearing about some, some uh, cultivated oral mucosal field transfer graphs um, for ocular surface reconstruction. And that's uh, very, very awesome that we have uh, three experts. Uh, so uh, starting us off for the evening here, we've got Miss Ida Hajara Sise. She's going to be telling us a lot about uh, these, uh, these types of transplants. And she's currently a cornea fellow uh, working with uh, uh, Samar Hamida um, at the uh, Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead in the United States, in, in the UK, uh, just south of London. Uh, so she was born in Barcelona where she studied medicine and then later uh, moved to central Spain where she did her ophthalmology residency at the University Hospital in Burgos. Uh, and uh, she did her cornea and anterior uh, segment uh, training at King's College Hospital in London, and then a second uh, cornea and anterior segment uh, fellowship, as well as working at the Eye Bank at uh, the Queen Victoria Hospital. So uh, quite a, an expert in that area, has done more fellowships than I have. And speaking of more fellowships than I have, uh, uh, Samer Hamada, Mr. Samer Hamada is uh, a pediatric uh, trained as well as cornea trained um, and uh, is the fellowship director uh, there at the Queen Victoria Hospital. And uh, in addition to that, we have uh, Kareem uh, El Sawa here for uh, a PhD uh, at the Queen Victoria Hospital also with uh, Mr. Hamada. So really an honor to have uh, three people so experienced in this area. And without further ado, uh, if you could take us away, Ida, we would appreciate it. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes? Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to, to be here and thank you for the privilege to present at your um, International Corner Rounds. So we're going to be talking about um, uh, this stem cell transplantation technique that we call COMET. And the concept is to transfer expanded epithelial multilayer uh, cells from the patient's uh, mouth onto the eye. And this, the aim is to repair and regenerate um, the ocular surface of patients with stem cell deficiency. And we have been doing this technique more or less since 2013. And thankfully, uh, this has given hope to some patients with um, um, a very complex ocular surface where um, other uh, previous techniques had failed. So uh, just to start with, um, a question for the audience. I would like to know if um, your unit offers uh, some kind of stem cell therapy um, for ocular surface reconstruction. And if the answer is yes, um, which is the preferred method of stem cell therapy? Oh, interesting. Okay, so <laughs> no, 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 the, no, no one is doing comment. Okay, so this will be very interesting. Great. So continuing with the next slide, as we all know, um, healthy ocular surface is maintained through a balance between corneal, limbal, uh, conjunctival epithelium, and tear film. There is a natural turnover of ocular surface epithelial cells. Um, they get shed, repaired, and replenished uh, throughout the lifetime. Um, it was Davinger and Evanson uh, who first uh, speculated that limbal palisades of Vogt serve as source for corneal epithelial cells. And then later on, based on the existing findings, Soft and friend proposed the XYZ hypothesis to explain how um, the central corneal epithelium was uh, replenished. And later it was um, uh, Schirmer that was the uh, first one to show evidence that these stem cells were indeed in the limbus. And um, he, he discovered that um, based on the uh, placement of the corneal specific keratin 12. Ida, are you sharing slides? 
Yes, sorry. Are you sharing the slides? I can't see slides here. No? Can you see the slides? No, we can see your slides from our end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm also seeing them. They may be open in a second window. Okay, oh. probably yes. Yeah, I'll try. Thank you. So, um, uh, the insults is, um, strong enough to damage the cells can lead to uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, there are uh, two causes that can be divided uh, into primary and secondary. A common congenital uh, cause is aniridia, aniridia. And I want to mention this especially because um, we have many aniridia patients in a community hospital and some of them have received uh, the comet um, surgery. And also as a common secondary cause are ocular burns, Steven Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and others. Um, patients uh, present with variable symptoms depending on the severity of the disease, ranging from minimal symptoms such as photophobia, blurred vision, to recurrent pain, red eye, loss of vision, and poor cosmesis in advanced cases. And this is another question for the audience. I'm very curious to know, um, how do you diagnose limbal stem cell deficiency? I think it can be multiple answers. Okay, interesting. Um, no one has said anterior segmentosity, and I'm just going to do some comment about that. Um, so, yeah, many people use um, the split limb examination, and we can see a uh, loss of uh, palisades of fault, and we can also see some kind of epithelial opacity. It's also um, very important to see the congenital epithelium. When it covers the cornea, it is more permeable uh, than the corneal epithelium. And this can lead to a characteristic late fluorescent staining of the cornea. And uh, it can be observed around 10, 15 minutes later of apply, after applying the fluorescent installation. Um, also, uh, this kind of vortex uh, pattern when the, there is epithelial thinning, it's also visible and loss of regenerative, regenerative ability can result in persistent epithelial defects and loss of the barrier function leads to corneal neovascularization due to chronic inflammation, growth of fibrovascular tissue and infection. And in more advanced cases, it can cause a corneal stomach scarring and as a, that is a common sequela due to all the factors above. So uh, corneal conjunctivalization can be confirmed clinically using in vivo confocal microscopy. And uh, it can, can help to define the phenotype of the cells uh, on the cornea. Because uh, conjunctival epithelial cells are hyperreflective with bright nuclei and ill-defined borders. And I think it can be um, visible in one of the slides over there. Okay. Uh, we can also use uh, corneal impression cytology and uh, immunohistochemistry that can show um, that the keratin 12, that is typical uh, for the corneal epithelium, is negative. I just wanted to mention that um, for anterior segment OCT, um, there has been some studies and some um, public, uh, publications regarding this, and has been uh, used to diagnose limbal stem cell deficiency by demonstrating significant thinning of the limbal epithelium in patients with a limbal stem cell deficiency. We can see the comparison. Uh, this would be a um, healthy patient and this will be one with limbal stem cell deficiency. So the treatment uh, is aimed at restoration and maintenance of a healthy corneal epithelium. To achieve this, it is crucial to consider all components uh, at the ocular surface homeostasis, uh, such as regeneration and lead and corneal interface, as well as dry treatment. 
Um, although multiple surgical, multiple surgical techniques of corneal uh, epithelial transplantation have been developed, uh, significant issues um, still remain. For example, use of allogenic tissues carries a risk of rejection and requires long-term immunosuppression, which can markedly reduce the patient's quality of life, especially in younger patients. In severe cases of ocular surface disease, um, such as ocular burns, Stephen Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and, uh, um, and aniridia, um, this, uh, there is often bilateral involvement. In these cases, autologous limbo transplantation is ruled out. So, uh, where can we obtain a source for coronary epithelials themselves for these patients? The concept of mouth to eye epithelial transplantation enables the use of abundant source uh, of epithelial cells for ocular um, reconstruction. And there are uh, three, um, essentially, um, uh, names of ex vivo cultured oral mucous cells, COMET, uh, COAMEX, and EVOMAU. Uh, there are minor differences uh, in terms of the method of cultivation and also the nomenclature, but we usually um, uh, use COMET in our department. There is also another type called uh, direct transfer, and it's used successfully, but leaves a considerable uh, large wound in the mouth, and it is thicker. And there is another type called SOMET, and it's based um, on principle of SLED, but it carries a number of disadvantages like risk of infection and longer healing. So, um, so we have COMET, and this is the first use of the technique in humans that was described by Nakamura in around 2004, this when the first article was published about this technique. So the main indications will be, as I mentioned before, especially bilateral cases, um, and severe and acute or chronic for limbal stem cell deficiency, ocular surface burns, Steven Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and anaeridia. Um, I would like to know from the audience, what do we think that is the primary goal of COMET? <laughs> yes, I understand. Yeah, we could say all of them, but the primary goal is the ocular surface stability. If we can control inflammation, great, um, we can achieve that sometimes. And in some cases, we can even go to the next step uh, for visual, visual rehabilitation. But the main, the main objective is to um, uh, uh, have stability of the ocular surface. And why, why comment? Why would we, do, would we do comment on a patient? Because it is readily available and there are many advantages. Uh, it is also autologous, which is a huge advantage in, uh, since it avoids the risk of long-term immunosuppression. And also conventional limb bulb transplants require weeks for the transplanted limb bulbs themselves to migrate from the cornea and cover the ocular surface but COMET can help to reduce the ocular inflammation significantly and quicker. It can be used in bilateral cases where there is no source of autologous limb bulbs themselves and the procedure can be repeated. There is now significant evidence and the support for the technique just keeps growing every year. But what are the disadvantages of the technique? Um, well, um, it is recognized that corneal neovascularization is commonly observed following comment. There have been many studies looking into this. Some authors uh, reported higher expression of angiogenic factors, but a recent report from Chen and others suggests that it is the lower expression of uh, some anti-angiogenic factors leading to neoangiogenesis. Thankfully, uh, in most cases it involves the peripheral cornea, it can, however, be an issue in patients uh, who require further coronal transplantation for visual rehabilitation. Also, uh, um, there are some reports saying that there is a lack of corneal epithelial clarity, and there, are, there is a bit of controversy 
between different studies, um, what is the success rate better in Comet or at CLED or other techniques. But my colleague Karim is going to talk about that because um, his uh, PhD is based on, on a comparison between uh, two techniques. So how can we improve the outcomes? There are several factors that have been associated with worse outcomes. For example, uh, dry eye must be treated intensively, punctal uh, occlusion, autologous serum eye drops, plasma eye drops, intensive lubric lubrication and control of uh, inflammation like meibomian gland dysfunction should be part of the preparative management. Uh, a study conducted um, at our hospital by the SOSA demonstrated that concurrent adnexal abnormalities um, we could say entropion, uh, simpleferon, are associated with worse graft outcomes and need to be corrected to improve the epithelial healing. Gunes Sakaran uh, also demonstrated that due to poor ocular surface and tear film, there is often colonization by pathogenic uh, bacteria and sometimes um, in, in some uh, hospitals they, they um, advise to do a congenital swap um, before comet. Also very, very important. A complete oral exam is also recommended since poor oral hygiene and smoking can compromise the quality of oral mucosal cells. Let's also remember that there are so many patients that um, uh, are candidates for uh, Comet and they have Steven Johnson syndrome. So we have to have a look at the oral mucosa and at the state of this. Um, here I have a picture of a patient um, that has severe rosacea. There are some reports of um, patients with this inflammation where Comet has failed and we don't expect this. And it can be um, because of the severe, uh, severe nevascularization and inflammation of the ocular surface. And I want to mention that in our hospital, we, we, our unit is not called ophthalmology department, it's called corneoplastics unit because we have um, a big association and combination of clinical and theater activity with uh, corneal department and the oculoplastics department. And this is really helping us with uh, uh, the comet patients. We have to uh, prepare the ocular surface, the eyelid abnormalities for next reconstruction before we go ahead with um, the ocular surface repair. So I'm just going to talk directly to the practical part of our technique. So, what we do, we um, divide the technique in two stages. Okay? We call COMET-1 at the stage where we um, do a biopsy from the buccal mucosa. Usually we use the buccal mucosa. In other hospitals, other studies, they use also the lid mucosa. And then um, this goes directly to our lab. And for three weeks, um, the lab um, takes the epithelial cells and they are fabricated ex vivo by culturing them and then it goes to the stage of the COMET-2, that is the second surgery, where we do the transplant directly with these um, oral mucosa epithelial cells, multilayers, onto the, the new that corneal surface. This is a bit of um, the technique, um, a bit more explaining the laboratory part. So we isolate the epithelial cells from the oral mucosa that are seeded onto the um, culture media with these green cells are like feeder cells, like fibroblasts. And uh, then this colony of cells, uh, it keeps growing and forming multilayer sheets with epithelial cells. And then we take a non adherent dressing material to lift these uh, oral mu um, uh, mucosa uh, epithelial cell sheets and then we transplant it on the ocular surface. So I think the advantage that we have in our hospital is that our laboratory is in the eye bank that is like 100 meters from um, our operating theaters. So this, um, this material is very fragile. When it, once it's ready, it's very fragile. But the transport is nothing in our hospital. We don't need a courier. And it's um, the same technicians of the eye bank that um, usually bring the material into our theater when we are about to start the surgery. And so, yes, this is because I want to, again, highlight the importance of the preoperative assessment. For example, this patient, that is a patient of ocular uh, cicatricial pemphigoid, 
required multiple surgeries to reconstruct the uh, fornix to correct the entropion, and now he is on the waiting list for Comet, but it required you know, um, a lot of follow-up with our glioplastics team. And I'm just going to show a video of Comet Part 1. So we do it under local anesthesia. We do two biopsies around three to five millimeter sponge, opposite to the um, inferior canine teeth. And these are some pictures shared by um, uh, Nigel Jordan, that is the main scientist in our eye bank. And these are the fibroblasts that we use, like feeders, um, to help grow the cells. And these are the oral mucosa cells that they are creating colonies, thanks to the fibroblast. And here we can see, like then there's a video from our eye bank. These are the multi-layer cells that we have achieved. We use this non-other material to place them around and we'll bring this to our theater. So this is just a small comment because um, I know not everyone is specialized in laboratory um, material, but for those of them who have a bit of experience, they would like to know what we use and what we don't use. I just want to highlight um, that we do not use a netic membrane and we do not use uh, temperature lowering and we don't use air lifting. For someone that has some experience in um, culturing uh, limb cells in, in, a, in an eye bank will be a bit surprised about this. And why I'm, I'm commenting on this because with the changes in the harvesting technique um, affect the results. So after reading many articles about this, some people think that yes, that this can affect, for example, the type of feeders. This, uh, this um, team used uh, limbal cells instead of normal feeders, and they discovered that the new sterilization was much less and they could achieve better results with the comet. And this is a video of the second stage of the surgery, the comet 2. We, did, we do 360 degrees peritomy and superficial keratectomy. Then we place the comet sheet. Usually on the, on the edges, we apply glue and we suture it. We can place two sheets and then we put the amniotic membrane and we do the sort of in these patients, yeah. Sometimes we use that moment to do meibomian gland expression. And these are the results for this patient after opening the tarsography four weeks later. We can see that um, the nevascularization has uh, improved significantly. And this is a question for the audience. I would like to know um, how do we measure success? <laughs> well, we could, uh, we could uh, measure success with all of them, but for Comet, it will be um, resolve um, persistent epithelial defect because we want to restore the ocular surface and this will be the main thing. Um, visual acuity is something secondary for more rehabilitation and resolve corneal vascularization. We cannot always achieve that with a Comet. In fact, it can even get worse sometimes after some point. So um, how can we, um, how do we measure the success? So ocular surface stability, um, clear appearance of the cornea with no epithelial defect, decrease uh, fibrovascular vascular tissue invasion, and no or minimal simblepharon. Can we consider um, failure maybe when there is persistent epithelial defect? Um, my colleague Karim is going to speak a bit more about this the outcomes. 
man, he also going to speak about this, but I just want to advance that we have seen poor outcomes in um, newborns, in neonates, in chemical injuries and inflammatory eye diseases because these patients um, tend to um, have a um, high rate of proliferation. For some reason, and my colleague is going to also speak about this, aniridia patients do better. And some cases need a combined um, um, approach. And uh, the surgery is very individual. We have to do a case selection of these cases. So my conclusion is that comedy is safe and effective for treatment of a limbic cell deficiency. Um, coronal vascularization induced in peripheral uh, corneal, um, sorry, I cannot see my presentation. This, you know. Uh, this is very just because the pictures are in front of the presentation, so I can see the images of the <laughs> our images are in front of the presentation, so I can see this. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. is it a way of moving the um, the images? Is it the um, the canvas images, Ida? So um, the pictures, uh, the images. Um, on the sidebar, sometimes you can uh, change the way that the images are on the screen. You can choose a single presenter versus okay. the multiple. Sorry. That may help. Yes, I can move them a bit, yeah. So, um, Sorry, the second conclusion is that coronal vascularization induced in peripheral cornea remains a problem after comet and this should be controlled, although it's difficult. And while well, I found that the use of unified tools for characterization of preoperative status, as well as a, standard, a standardized assessment of outcomes, would allow better comparison of results between techniques. However, um, we have to, um, I want to remind the audience that we have, these are very complex patients, especially our, our cohort of patients is um, uh, mainly aniridia. They require um, uh, glaucoma surgeries and treatment, um, operative surface reconstruction. They have problems with um, uh, intraocular lens implantation. So it's many um, combined surgeries and pathologies, and it's very difficult to assess the outcomes and compare it with another cohort in another hospital. And sorry. And I just want to thank um, my consultants, Mr. Hamada, Mr. Ralph, and Mr. Lake, and also the Ivan team, especially Nigel Jordan, that is the uh, principal scientist and has been helping provide some information. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Aida. Are you waiting for Karim to present his part, yeah? Mm -hmm. Shall I do a couple of comments while waiting for Karim? Yes. Um, I think I'm glad you highlighted the role of epithelial mapping. I think this is a growing area where you can uh, have some information about the healthiness, or let's say how sick is the epithelium by measuring the corneal thickness, epithelial map thickness. Um, there is many papers now actually showed the relationship between corneal maps, in particular epithelial thickness and various diseases, and especially limbal stem cell deficiency. And I think a lot of times those cases, especially if you, if you look, dig deep into those ocular surface disease cases, quite often they have a stage before they are really bad and you see the conjunctivalization of the cornea. It's a, it's a time period where the corneal epithelium becomes so thin and very variable in thickness across various points of the cornea. And that's actually indicating that this epithelium is not healthy. So it's, it's, there is a stage, and I think this has opened the door for early diagnosis and management, because I think, I hope we all agree that when it's, it is conjunctivalization happened already, you lost your corneal stem cells, and that's where it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of a battle to restore the whole uh, service integrity. 
Um, so that is one point. So I'm glad you mentioned something about the epithelial mapping and its role. The second thing is about uh, corneal new vascularization. And I, I can see that the, one of the criticism was for the comet is that there is a lot of corneal new vessels. This is micro vessels in the epithelium. However, I have to say in our group or results, I don't think we observed so many of those. Um, and I think it's part of it to do with the way the cells are cultured. So it's, it's the technique, the eye bank uh, expands cells in the, in the lab. And I think that uh, can play a role. Plus, and that's very important, we have to remember that it's what we're doing here, it, we, we putting a, a progenerator cells in an ocular surface that is sick and diseased. And you have to allow for the success, and that's a very big element of success, to allow the right microenvironment. And uh, I'm sure you heard this term before, but uh, the definition of optimizing ocular surface is very variable, but it's all about optimizing the microenvironment. And what I mean by that, I mean, you ensuring that you have an ocular surface that is, is not inflamed, it is well lubricated, and it's, uh, it's controlled. And you can see in the comment that the big element of success is one, we, we can grow the cells. And second is that we prepare the patient. So you've got pre-op micro environment optimization by, as you said, lid uh, management, fornix reconstruction, various con ways to control the inflammation before we just adventure into just doing the surgery. Because I, th I think the surgery is the easiest part of the whole thing. And then intraoperative microenvironment management is where you put the amniotic membrane on top, you're doing the tarsography, you try to protect the cells. And then you come to the postoperative micromanagement, microenvironment management is where uh, we, we haven't mentioned the serum eye drops. So our patients all will have uh, drops, serum eye drops after the surgery. So when they come for stage one, we take the bloods, over three weeks, the blood processed. So when they come for having the second stage three weeks later, they're gonna have the culture cells implanted and then they're gonna have to start their serum eye drops. Plus, as I said, other things, the usual way to control inflammation. And it's not unusual, I give those patients uh, oral steroids as a bit of anti-inflammatory. Uh, we're not worried about rejection here, obviously. This is auto cells, but we worry about inflammation. And, and, and early um, uh, destruction of these uh, fragile cells. So this is microenvironment. I think the term is very suitable for this kind of condition. And one last one is about the, uh, the success. And I think the success have to be linked with the time frame as well, because uh, when we say 70%, uh, I think you have to, to say over how many years. And, and, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned about standardization to be able to compare the studies because when you look across you find very so many variables and you can't really simply compare one paper to another mm -hmm. so let, let's see some results i hope that's what karim had been doing looking at the outcomes of our uh, work here and comparing with other uh, stem cell transplantation uh, methods so karim if you're ready with your presentation we'll be glad to hear I think you're muted, Karim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just looking for uh, the presentation. Uh, is the screen? We can see our screen, but we can't see the presentation yet.
he seems to be a little bit frozen. I wonder if he's having a connection issue at the moment. Hello, everyone. Yes, we can hear you now, Kareem. Thank you. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kareem Sawah. I'm uh, a cornea fellow at the Research Institute of Solomology in Egypt. Uh, I had the chance and the pleasure to uh, be uh, in Queen Victoria Hospital Cornioplastic Unit uh, during my PhD uh, under supervision of uh, Mr. Mohamed Alfi, Mr. Hamada, and uh, Mr. Blake, whom I'd like to thank very much for uh, having me during this period and for the continuous support they were giving me during my stay and even uh, overseas. Uh, today I will be talking about the techniques and outcomes of cell expansion for limbal stem cell transplantation, comet uh, versus ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation. The limbal Karim, graft were I'm, I'm not able to see your slides just yet. I don't know if anyone else is seeing his slides, but uh, but I am not. Um, so uh, everyone can hear me first. Yes, we can hear you well. So what um, I'm sharing my screen now. I'm having the slides, so I don't know if uh, it's shared on your screens or not. Uh, I think it's frozen. Could you unshare it and then reshare again, please? Okay. Victoria, do you have any other suggestions for him? Yeah, this you might be sharing your desktop. Um, are you able to share the slide deck specifically? Um, when you click share, you'll see a certain number of windows and you should have the presentation open. And then um, once you click share, then you can share the specific window. So uh, everything is frozen right now. So I'm just waiting. Okay. I'm really sorry. It's okay, maybe I'll ask a few questions that I was going to ask at the end, just to keep us moving along. Um, uh, you know, either Ida or uh, Mr. Hamada, if you, uh, are you using confocal microscopy? And if so, which, which confocal are you using? Because of course, confocal is disappearing rapidly all over the world at the moment. We do have a confocal microscopy, but that is not used in this study before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had the big one. Uh, I have to say, it's um, it, we have it. I think one year now, and the focus is on uh, on various other projects, not the comet one. Uh, but uh, that is one of the things that we want to consider, looking at the uh, the outcomes by doing um, uh, in vivo for confocal microscopy to those patients. Very interesting. Um, I'll ask a few questions because I've done maybe, I think, three comets in my life uh, because Mark Daniel, where I did my cornea fellowship, does some and um, mm -hmm. can say that I'm certainly no expert in this area. So thank you so much for your expertise. But uh, we were always using Amnion as the, as the carrier. And um, I was very curious, what is it? You said it was a, a non-adherent uh, dressing that you were using uh, yeah. to transfer the cells. And is it how many layer, cell layers thick is the, is the actual graph that you're generating? Okay, so the, uh, this is uh, like a, a dermal patch. This is not a membrane, this is not a biologic. This mm -hmm. is just to lift the cells off the glass. So these are free floating cells growing in the glass. And then they use that tigger derm just to, to fold the, the sheet of cells, which are around six to seven layers of cells. And that is uh, it's just a carrier, basically. And as you can see, the scientists use it at the last stage. So this happened just on the day, an hour or two before the this, this cells transfer to theater. So it just, uh, just to keep it viable as much as possible. And normally, they grow a couple of sheets. Uh, I think I showed you one video, um, but there is different ways we do it. So uh, mm -hmm. I sometimes use the two sheets, one on top of the other. Sometimes one sheet and the other one, we do it like, like a sausage around the limbus. Uh, 
so can populate the limbal area with the with those cells uh, i think karim we can see your slides now hopefully it's okay now yeah uh, sorry nigel told me that uh, we usually achieve um, four sheets um two of them are to be used and one of them is is to um, to be for the um, you know just as information for the eye bank and yeah basically that yeah Excellent. Uh, I'll continue. I have some other questions, but um, we'll turn it over to Kareem if you're if you're ready and uh, things are working. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, everyone is hearing me. Hearing me? Yep, we can hear you well. Okay. So today I will be talking about the techniques and outcomes of cell expansion for limbal stem cells transplantation, comet versus ex vivo uh, cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation. Uh, limbal graft were described as the first curative technique for limbal stem cell deficiency by Jose Parker in 1964. Uh, the, the palisades of Vogt contain uh, the limbal epithelial niche for the corneal epithelial stem cells, which is important for the integration of the corneal epithelium. As my colleague mentioned, there is different causes of limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, some of them are more favorable than the other. Uh, so we have the traumatic, iatrogenic, and malignant causes, and we have the inflammatory, hereditary, and neuropathic causes. Uh, and uh, like Stephen Johnson, aniridia, and the mucous membrane benfigoid. The first step in management of limbal stem cell deficiency is optimization of the ocular surface, uh, which can be done uh, either by controlling the causative factor, uh, giving immune suppression for autoimmune disease, antibiotics for infection, corticosteroids for inflammation, or removal of corneal tumors in case of malignancy, uh, or by managing the comorbid conditions. Uh, in case of equosteer deficiency, we can use bantal occlusion, autologous serum, scleral lenses, and salivary gland implants. For cicatricial complication, we either can do a fornix construction with amniotic membrane transplantation, any eyelid malposition like Trichases, introvian, extrovian should be repaired first. And uh, in cases of persistent epithelial defects, we can manage them by Botox injection or Tarsor. There's different uh, methods of uh, cultivation of limbal epithelial cells, but today we are talking in, uh, here in uh, the comparison between ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation and the cultivated oral mucosal epithelial transplantation. This vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation was applied for the treatment of the ocular surface by Pellegrini et al. in 1997. It can be either autologous or algebraic. Uh, it has the advantage of reducible with minimal effect of the healthy eye due to a small size of biopsy in case of autologous transplantation. The disadvantage of this procedure is the high cost and the need for a good manufacturing practice and facility to properly process and expand the harvested limbal stem cells. Cultivated oral mucosal epithelial transplantation was uh, first described in 1963 by Ballen and co workers. In 2003, Nakamura and the co workers developed the method to culture rabbit oral mucosal epithelial cells on an amniotic membrane as a carrier. In 2006, four further studies confirmed successful results. Uh, the advantage of this uh, technique is uh, that it has good results and there is no need for immune suppression. The aim of this study was to compare between the outcomes of ex vivo stem cell cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation and cultivated oral mucosal epithelial transplantation in the management of limbal stem cell deficiency due to various etiologies. It was done in Queen Victoria Hospital, corneoplastic unit, East Grinstead, uh, in United Kingdom. For the ex vivo cases, it was, they were done uh, between 2004 and 2019. For the comet cases, they were done between 2014 and 2019. Our primary outcome measure was having a stable epithelialized corneal surface with no epithelial defect and absence of inflammation. The secondary outcome measures were uh, the visual acuity and complications rate. 
Our inclusion criteria included uh, nimble stem cell deficiency caused by various etiologies resistant to conventional therapy in a stable phase of nimble stem cell deficiency six months or more after the primary insult, after optimization of the ocular surface. 41 procedures were done in, uh, for the comet uh, on 36 patients. For the ex vivo procedures, there were 69 uh, procedures on 48 patients. 36 procedures were done uh, only limbal stem cell transplantation in the comet group. Uh, five procedures were combined keratoplasty, either DALC or penetrating keratoplasty with limbal stem cell transplantation and 54 limbal stem cell transplantation only in the ex vivo uh, group and 15 combined surgeries. The most common etiology in our cohort was uh, aniridia. Uh, so we had 12, uh, 18 procedures in the comment group and 29 in the ex vivo group. The second most common uh, etiology was chemical burn. We had nine, 10 procedures in the COMET group and 15 in the ex vivo group. The third most common uh, etiology was Steven Johnson, four procedures in COMET and nine procedures in ex vivo. At the end of the follow-up, the graft survival rate was 81.7% in the ex vivo group and 60.7% in the COMET group. It was significantly better in the ex vivo group and than in the comet group. After having a successful comet or ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation, further surgeries was done like keratoplasty to enhance the visual acuity. So 17% uh, in, in the comet group and 11.6% in the ex vivo group. During the follow-up period, various procedures were done like fine needle diacermy or subconjunctival avastin for corneal vascularization uh, or eyelid surgeries to further enhance and optimize the ocular surface to keep the integrity of the stem cells. Punctal occlusion, amniotic membrane transplantation or tarsorophy in cases of epithelial defects during the follow-up period, but there was no significant difference between the two groups. 48.8% in the comment group had no complications, 40.6% had no complication in the ex vivo group. The most common complication was elevated intraocular pressure, which was due to steroid use. It was either controlled medically or surgically using Ahmed valve, Barvel's valve, or subscalar trabeculectomy. We can see that uh, immune suppression complication happened in nine uh, patients, 30% uh, of the uh, ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation group, uh, which was controlled either by decreasing the dose of immune suppression or stopping the immune suppression treatment, but there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups and the overall complication rate. There was no statistically significant improvement in the final and the initial between the final and the initial visual acuity uh, in the comet group, and there was statistically significant improvement between the final and the initial visual acuity in the ex vivo group, but there was no significant change in the final visual acuity between the two groups. We can see uh, by reviewing the literature, there was a wide range between pre and post operative. Uh, visual acuity, and this change is influenced by many factors like the preoperative visual acuity, the main etiology uh, of the limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, and uh, the comorbid conditions like cataract glaucoma. So, this affected uh, the results between the studs. Uh, the case number one that we have here it was a female patient, 50, uh, 57 years old, an iridium. Uh, it showed up with a complete conjunctivalized cornea with superficial corneal scar. The visual acuity at presentation was counting finger and pinhole 660. Uh, this patient has comment, comment one followed after three weeks by comment two. The post-operative treatment included dexamethasone, uh, steroids, chloram phenicol antibiotic, and prednisolone 60 milligram with gradual withdrawal over a month uh, and plasma eye drops. 
After six months, PK was done after having a stable comet for six months, penetrating keratoplasty was done with a sclerocorneal button 12.5 millimeters. But during the follow-up period, IOP elevated, which was not controlled medically. Uh, so Ahmad valve with a scleral patch was done six months after the penetrating keratoplasty. Two years after the penetrating keratoplasty, another penetrating keratoplasty was done, eight millimeters graft due to intercedial failure from Ahmad valve. So overall follow-up period for this case was four years, but we finally achieved the final visual acuity of 660 and the pinhole vision of 648. This is a picture of the case one year after comet and six months after uh, penetrating keratoplasty showing the clear cornea. Second case, it was also an aniridia patient, 86 years old, with complete conjunctivalization of the cornea, glucometus on topical treatment. The visual acuity was 160 at presentation, 260 pinhole. This patient also has comet one followed after three weeks by comet two. One year after having a stable comet, DALC was done with cataract extraction but without implantation. After one year of DALC, uh, the elevated interoperation was not controlled, so Ahmad valve was done. One year after DALC, a scare fixated IOL. So after an overall follow up period of five years, we achieved the final visual acuity of 648. So as we can see, these all are complex cases which require regular follow-up and management to reach the final stable condition and achieve the visual acuity that we are seeking for the patient. This months after comment, as we can see here, we have like a clear cornea and a stable ocular surface. Third case is a female patient, 60 years old, with idiopathic bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, which showed up with a completely conjunctivalized cornea. The visual acuity at presentation was 360 and 560 in whole vision. This patient has uh, ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation uh, with uh, immunosuppression, cyclosporin, uh, 100 milligram per day. Uh, after 10 months, the first graft failed. Uh, two years after the first one, another ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation was done and it was stable and successful for two years, which was followed by DALC. The overall follow-up after the ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation was five years, and this patient achieved a final visual acuity of 648 vision and the pinhole of 612. This is the picture of uh, the case one day post-operative. Uh, as we can see, we can see the uh, ex vivo sheet, the amniotic membrane, and contact lens. In conclusion, at the time uh, we are publishing these results, this study is considered the largest study in UK in the world to assess and to compare between these two procedures in the management of severe limbal stem cell deficiency. We can see that both ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation and the cultivated oral mucosal epithelial transplantation are effective in the management of severe limbal stem cell deficiency where patients have reached therapeutic impasse. Although COMET had lower success rate than the ex vivo cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation, the benefit of not using immunosuppressant drugs is highly favorable and allowed the usage of COMET in special situations like children without fearing of graft rejection. Uh, Karim, if you go back to your slides of first case, it's okay, the picture we put at the post top. This one? Uh, first case, outcomes. Yeah, this one. So, and the reason why I want to comment on this, because I think uh, when you compare the, first of all, they have to think one, how many procedures do you need to ensure stability of ocular surface? And it's not always about that golden, one stem cell transplantation surgery that's gonna restore the whole surface because it's like everything else this is a very sick ocular surface there is a lot of comorbidities you could see those patients almost all of them need a glaucoma surgery usually a valve cataract of occasionally multiple ocular surface surgeries and we keep injecting avastin which is we know it doesn't uh, it's not friendly to the epithelium 
So there is a lot of, of factors here. And I think from from my experience, and I'll, I'll be interested to know, Karim, how many patients how many patient you've seen had the two grafts or more and, and to see the result? Because I think I always tell the patients, you're going to need minimal two uh, stem cell transplantations. And we measure the success of five years is around 60%. And I think this has been from our study uh, and our experience since 2013 with the comet itself. And I think um, there is another uh, uh, PhD project looked at the, uh, the ex vivo alone and they found the result around 60% after two grafts, 60, 65% after two grafts. So, so, so this is important to think about it as what I'm achieving by doing a comet transplantation. So one, actually, you might don't need ever to do uh, allograft transplantation. So you don't need to do ex vivo stem cells. You don't need to do all that. With all the advantage um, uh, Ida and Karim already explained. But I think this is a very important thing. And here why I put this picture here. So if you look at the, at the, um, the photo, the, the one with the fluorescein, top left, you can see and this is when I first doing those cases, I start to look, where, where is this epithelium end? Where is the limbus now? Where is the, the stem cells uh, stop? And I couldn't find the borders. And I said, right. And I then start to see, actually, we have here like maybe two zones only. You got the conjunctiva, which is thin. You can see uh, uh, around three millimeter away from the limbus. So it looks like what we've done, this limbus has expanded something like two to three millimeter outside the anatomical limbus, which was supposed to be a limbus. So it looks like these cells, although they sit on the cornea, they really like to grow more on the conjunctiva, on the sclera, I should say, and they populate the a rim of three millimeter around the limbus. And I call that a, the buffer zone. And I couldn't found, actually, despite the failure, which you see later, you still got this lovely area, the puffer zone, always there. Always stop as a barrier, stop the conjunctiva from growing again into the cornea. So also we see failure of the comet, but actually we're still restoring that kind of, of structure we achieved here. And that's where you find actually, when you come to do the second stem cell transplantation, whether we're talking about another comet or another ex vivo or another slit, it works much better. Then suddenly we boost up our success rate. Guess what? Because we ensured here, we got a new micro environment. You got a new structure. Because remember one important thing, where are the stem cells lives? Where is the anatomy here? Where is the niche here? It's gone. So we creating something completely different now. This cells populate on the surface. I don't think they sit inside anywhere in the in the in, in niches in the cornea. So they already pop in the surface and obviously they're always under ongoing trauma from the environment, exposure, etc. And gradually they you lose them. So you need an, a, a second procedure. And that's why I think every kind of few years, those patients will probably need more. And uh, the second thing, so that's why I put this picture to show the puffer zone. And you can see clearly where is the conjunctiva actually. And you can look at the staining here. It's obvious where the conjunctival staining and when is the cornea, the new cornea, phenotype staining. And uh, so that is the buffer zone. Um, additional procedure, we talked about it. And I said here, really, this is a complex cases. And because there are additional procedure required. And you will see that even though you've done one comet surgery, for example, that actually gives you a lot of stability to ocular surface to allow you to treat a glaucoma, which is a blinding disease, because ocular surface management can delay because they, they're not going to see today, but they might see in three few years, but you can't delay glaucoma management. So by doing those surgeries, actually you're allowing a better surface to, to help you to get to do with their cataract, their, their valves, whatever. So actually it has a lot of additional advantages we don't it doesn't have to be a direct advantage and the final point i want to say here about the impression uh, uh, sorry about the immunosuppression treatment right so 13 percent uh, karim you presented they have a complication now if we look the details of the complication 
you found some of them can be serious, even though we stopped the treatment, but actually these are young patients, a lot of them, very young, and you put them at risk of immunosuppression treatment. And since we introduced Comet, we always tell the patients, unless there is obviously a, a specific indication to, diff, to one procedure, we just say, you can, I can use your oral mucosa, I can do meat, mouth to eye, epithelial transplantation, or I'm happy to use these uh, expanded cells from, from someone else, the allograft. And patients always, always say, no, use my cells. I want to help myself. They don't want immunosuppression treatment, obviously. So that is why suddenly you find Comet actually give you a lot of advantages. Not only it's my auto cells, this is also uh, give me a bit of a new microenvironment for any future surgeries to be done. Thank you. It's really uh, fa fascinating work that you guys are doing, and um, I have a whole raft of questions here, but I do think that we are uh, at around our uh, time for conclusion here now, so um, unless there's a burning question that uh, anyone would like to ask, I think we will uh, wrap things up. Uh, thank you again so much for uh, being with us today, and uh, hopefully you're okay with maybe us emailing you some questions down the line uh, in the future. Uh, we'll remind everyone that a link to the evaluation form has been posted in the chat. So please do go ahead and fill out the uh, uh, evaluation forms. Thank you again, all of you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us today.